We could we could start off the show by bobbing heads. And then people will be like, what's this? Look at all this movement. And there's this happy music. Uh, good morning. Good mid-morning. Uh, mm-hmm. She's Rebecca. She's Elise. I'm Jimmy. I guess every show needs a name. And we just informally, formally, informally decided to brunch. Bunch? Brunch, brunch, brunch. I do a live stream with Dave Kittle and Tony Maritato an hour, two hours ago, 8.30 a.m. Eastern. And we call it Breakfast Club. It's as early as you're going to get me out of bed, 8.30. In college, <laughs> that was the earliest class. And I was like, oh, and then professors are like, you know, when you get a job, it's that time or earlier, right? I was like, no, this is fun. But now Depends. I guess we'll do the brunch bunch. So uh, Rebecca is the ED DPT and Elise is the Onco PT. And I'm Jimmy. I think that's what I that's what I bring to the table. I'm Jimmy. You're the Jimmy PT. I'm the Jimmy PT. Jimmy PT. <laughs> um, today we're going to talk about, we usually, we normally would do, we were getting into a rhythm of reading APTA magazine mm-hmm. and then discussing. Discuss like coffee talk, yep. chickpeas. They're neither chicks nor peas. Discuss, discuss. That's a Saturday Night Live bit. Do you not know that one? Nope, don't know that one. Making SNL references that people don't get now. That's when you're this year's old. Sorry. But the idea was APTA Magazine comes out monthly. We read it, talk about it, give us our th- give you our thoughts. We break it down. We make it, and then we just kept looking at our mailboxes. And it never showed up. And then we realized we some Rebecca, you did some research and you found out what. It doesn't come out in January. Like January is the break month for PT Magazine. <laughs> they have it. It's just not a physical copy. There's a no, digital. Copy. No, there's not there's even nothing. a digital copy in January. The digital oh. copy for February is out. So if you're like, can't wait to get to your mailbox, you can download okay. it today. Right. Um, happy February, by the way. Happy CSM month. I can't wait. Uh, yeah. But I'm not sure when it's going to hit the mailbox. So now I'm like back on mailbox watch. Yeah. That was a little late on the. Happy CSM month. So yeah. So anyway, we'll be we'll be back later with an analysis of the an analysis. I don't want to call it an analysis. We'll we'll chew the fat on the latest APTA magazine. See what's mm-hmm. on. There. Can we do okay, a, a, a few? I'm going to say this into existence. What is the woman's name who does the ethics thing? Oh, she's my favorite, and I don't remember her name. Um, it, I like her a lot. I read those every. Maria Cohen, Doctor Doctor Cohen. Is that who it is? I like her thing a lot because I should not like ethics at all. I'd be like, I don't know, ethics are sort of boring. And then the way they frame this, the way she does this, is she puts it into story, which is a lesson. She puts it into a story, and you're like, and it's always difficult, right? It's like, you make the call. It's like, what would you do? And it's like, well, I would do this. And then you're like, would you? And it's like this great way of like sort of, it just, the goal is make you think. There's no right answer, or there might be. I mean, there, there are right answers. Don't do the illegal thing. Um, but it would be I'm gonna say this into existence. Maybe we get her on the show once. Does anybody know her? Amazing. Someone listening knows her. Tell her we're fangirling. I'm fanboying. Is it the gender of the person doing the fanning or the per- whatever? I like her a lot. I like what she does. And it would be great to do a live one and have her. I would love her thought process when she's writing these. Like, how do you oh, are these really cool. real? Are they based in reality? Like, remember Law and Order? It would be like. There'd be a crazy case in the news, and then two weeks later, there'd be a Law and Order episode. Right. Ripped from the headlines. I'm like, dude, this is not ripped. This is copied from the headlines. This is not ripped from the headlines. You copied this. Anyway, I'm saying that into his existence. What we're here to talk about today is the topic of today is mistakes, failures, big ones, little ones, red ones, green ones, one fish, two fish. No, sorry, wrong one. Um, but the idea is like, let's talk about some failures. And then wh- how we got over them. And I think this is a good way to, number one, remember that a lot of people that you see on stage at CSM, remember Chad Cook saying this once. And he's like, man, I felt a lot or something. Like he was like being, I don't think he was being humble. I think he was just being like, this hat, like you see me as Chad Cook. I think it was Chad Cook. But like, I I had to go through not knowing stuff for a long time. Yeah. And I'm, a little bit of stuff, then I need more stuff, and I need more stuff. So I think this is a good way to, I think it's a good way for me personally to get it out and relive that thing again and be like, oh, Mm -hmm. how can I apply my familiar tools in unfamiliar places now, right? In the present, how can I use my familiar tools from the past in the present? And it's good to hear the fact that other people screw up because on these things, these cell phones, we see a lot of wins, a lot of highlight reels. I go to ESPN and I see top plays and I see scores and wins. And on the Instagrams, I see a lot of videos that get a billion views. And my views are only getting 400 or 1,000 or nothing. And you're like, I'm in last place. And that ain't, I'm a, that's mm-hmm. not. So who wants to go first in this episode of 
failure or is it mistakes failure of the same thing i, I think know. i think it's kind of a little bit about that i'm gonna go first because what i'm gonna tell you is gonna make you feel better about whatever you're gonna say so okay. i'm just gonna like rip the band-aid off let's I'm go i'm gonna tell you a story about a patient so when i started in acute care like i didn't get a great orientation i had never even had a clinical in acute care i didn't really know what i was doing so i just need you to like imagine that and then i was in the medical icu and one of the patients was like getting really restless, really wanted to leave the hospital, like wanted to go outside, like didn't no longer wanted to be there and was like willing to do whatever it took to leave the hospital. And so finally the physician said, hey, can you please just take this patient outside? And he had like a drain coming out of his skull, one of those ones that's like sutured into the top and like all of that's like on the IV pole and he's not walking right. We're just going to go in a wheelchair. But so I'm new, uh, suddenly in the ICU, and they want me to take someone out of the ICU into the wild. And I was like, okay, because I believe in that. I like, I like if you want to go outside, I'm going to try and get you there. Um, but I was so nervous. And the patient knew I was nervous. And he was probably around my age, which also made me feel nervous. And I know you're supposed to always act like you know more than the patient, but it was scary. And so we're going out in the wheelchair. And we hit a bump coming out of the hospital and I'm like, oh my God. And I'm like holding onto the pole and I'm holding onto the thing, remembering that there's a drain in his brain that's attached to this pole. And we make it over all the bumps and I'm like, okay, okay. He didn't fall. The drain didn't fall. Like nothing fell. And then as we're going into the garden, cause we have this beautiful garden, you know, those like differences in the sidewalk. Yeah. Like the pipe. Yeah. 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 I hit one of those. Mm. Okay had my hand in front of the patient's chest. Patient didn't go anywhere, but the pole, yeah, oh, the all the way onto the ground, the pulling on this guy's head. Mm. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And I start panicking, right? And there's all these people around and he's bent forward like this and it's sutured in so deeply. Like it's not actually coming out. It's all fine, mm. but it looks really bad. And he just turns his head and he looks at me and he goes, you need to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I just need you to calm down. You're ruining this for me. <laughs> and so I picked up the pole, took some cleansing breaths. Yeah. And then we had a great time in the garden. You didn't, your heart rate didn't come down for hours. No, 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 it didn't. And I thought maybe I shouldn't be a physical therapist. I shouldn't be in the ICU. I definitely like was regretting my choice to move into acute care. Like not great. All right. Well, laughing about it now. I like how, I mean, I like how the patient was the teacher there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Aren't they always though? I'm going to, yeah, I'm yes. going to calm down. I'm going to need great. you to calm down. No, I'm, good. <laughs> I, I'm glad it didn't come out. I wouldn't want to have that visual in my head the rest of the day. No, that I still me? think about it. I still think about it. Every time I have a patient with a drain, I'm like, mm-hmm. Okay. The journey my heart rate went on during your story, yeah. Rebecca, like, That's oh my right. God. <laughs> So I'll draw a parallel. I'll, I'll I'll tell a clinical story, but like in radio, we used to, when we used to use CDs. There would be three CD players, and you were always getting you were playing one, and then there were two like on the way. But inevitably, someone told me this: the way you pop the CDs were in these like little metal uh, plastic cases, right? And then you'd push up, and it would pop out. That's how you pop the CD out. And someone told me when they were teaching me how to use it, they're like, "You will pop out the one that is playing on the air, and then you will be dead air for until you." frantically figure out what song to put on next and i'm like i'm never gonna do that no. and then you do that and you get a shot of adrenaline because you realize what you just did even though the funny part is no one can see you doing it like it could have just been mechanical there you could play it off but you know you did it you get a shot of adrenaline and you feel like an idiot for the rest of the day and you doubt why you're there but every what rebecca just said every time i reach for that cd player i thought for a quarter of a second is this is this the is this the one I'm not supposed to pop out? Because I've I've touched the stove, I've burned my hand, and now I'm going. Oh wait, is that the burner that was on? No, no, no. Okay, good. That's how we learn. We're big dumb animals, and we learn by that. Like you have to get burned a little bit. I really appreciate lately, Jimmy. I've been seeing you posting on like how we learn, right? The mm -hmm. the education and how life is life is the test, and we do the test and we fail the test, and then we learn. Where school is backwards, right? right. And I think like. My my first mistake that I'm going to talk about is a little more mm. on the light side, but I think it is very much like I had to goof it up yeah. really badly. And then now I don't make that mistake anymore because I check. So I was working with a patient who had 
breast cancer and had a mastectomy, like a single mastectomy, one side, one side was the surgical side. The other was not. And so I get it. I'm working with the patient on her shoulder range of motion, whatever. And I'm like 30 minutes in manual stretching, all the things, whatever. And she so kindly was like, oh, this has felt so great. Are we going to do the same to my other side? And I just... Oh my God. Yeah. And I, I credit my say? clinical instructor because she was outside and I'm sure she was mentally coaching me from afar. <laughs> and it was just like, you know, sometimes there's some carryover yeah. between, you know, the, the non-affected to the affected side. So we're just getting that side ready. And now we're going to work on this side. We got to get a base on what I wanted to do is I started with the unaffected side, not the good or bad side. Right. The unaffected, and I, why I wanted to get a feel 30 minutes is usually what we say. And now you're right. I'm yeah. going to switch over and do the what Chris Voss from that book would say, do late night radio DJ voice. Like, yep. Uh, hmm, yep. What I'm doing there is uh, I'm, I'm switching sides now. We've I just wanted you to feel that. comfortable. I just, just wanted, wanted to make sure nice and relax before feel. we moved on to that. I just want you to know what it should feel like. Right. And now we're going to get the other side to that. But like, <laughs> we, as much as people as as healthcare people mock patients like lay on your back and then they just go and on my back or with my back in the air i do the same. when i would go to get a massage they're like on your back and i'm like yep my back you're gonna rub my back so i need to be on my stomach and they they were very clear with their instruction but our brains are dumb mm-hmm. especially because you're in this weird spot too like i'm what do i you know, I see it a lot and I saw it a lot with a stand up co- comedian will do it with cops like he was mocking police officers and not to mock cops, but like they're in a high pressure situation trying to get someone to do something. So a lot of times I forget what comedian it was. He's like, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and ask you to 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 turn the car off. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to, to get out of the car. And the, and the guy was like, are you going to ask me? Or are you asking me to do that? And then a lot of times you'll get multiple instructions at the same time. Hands up, oh, hands man. up, put your hands up, put your hands behind your back, put your hands behind your head, interlock it. And, but open the door and you're like, which one of those things do you want me to do right now? Because this is the first time I've been in this situation. And a lot of times patients, it's the first time they've been in that situation. Mm-hmm. On my stomach or you want to, my stomach up or the, uh, we do, we flip flop. This is kind of like related, unrelated, but I found an Instagram account yesterday called Emergency Resilience. Okay. And it is really interesting. And one of the things this person teaches people is how to do death notifications appropriately. And one of the things she posted was all the ways that people talk around it are confusing and hurtful to the person that you're notifying. So like, just like you were saying, the too many instructions, they're like, the person's passed, they're gone, they're not with us anymore. And they were like, family members were like, where did they go? Where are they? What floor? Where did right. you leave them? Are they at a different hospital? Like, right. they didn't make it. Didn't make what? Like, they weren't in surgery. Like, what? What happened? And she said it's really crucial to actually like use the words dead or died, yeah. and that it's like the most effective way to do that. And so I think about how many times I'm communicating. I mean, not that serious of things, but how unclearly am I communicating, and what words should I really be using? Yeah. The military uses, have you guys ever heard of bluff? Uh, the military uses this acronym, bottom line up front. And oh. like a lot of innovation comes out of military or or cops, firemen, EMTs, because it's like sort of important to get the message right like now. So bottom line up front is like the third sentence in your message should not be the patient is dead. That's mm-hmm. that's the subject line. That is in 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 journalism, it's the, what they call the inverted pyramid. It's a it's a pyramid that's wide at the top and pointy at the bottom. Read any news story or any good blog article, and the most important stuff is the top, right? As it should be structured, because a lot of times people don't make it to the bottom. So you better bottom line up front. I know it's the bottom line because in math, the answer's at the bottom, right? Forty two plus sixty two, but and the answer's at the bottom. <laughs> Flip it. Bottom line's got to be up front. Mm-hmm. If I were to suggest a book, it would be Smart Brevity. Mm. It's got Dave Pavo. Uh, uh, gave me a compliment. He's like, "You have you you've read Smart Brevity?" I was like, "I have no idea what you're talking about." And he's like, "It was. Have you guys ever heard of Politico or Axios? They're like political, yeah. whatever." But that's not why. They sort of they went from being writers at like the Washington Post or whatever these big news outlets that would write three, four, five thousand word articles. Mm-hmm. And then when journalism went online, they could measure how far people went or how long they read and where they thought. I wrote a 4,000 word article. It's my 4,000 word article is better than your thousand word article. Well, not if I use a thousand of the best, better words. Right. And they were able to measure now that journalism went digital and they found this smart brevity format 
And you've read it, whether you know it or not. A lot of brands that write words, and these are words or scripts for videos. Because mm-hmm. videos 15, five years ago, to shorts now. I can tr- We can now transmit more information in a 60-second or less short than people did in a 10-minute video. Yep. It's and the, and the scientific principle there is signal versus noise ratio. Now there's so there's a lot of noise, but you need that one little message to go. Great. Bottom line up front or smart brevity or tell me so, the question in in the book smart brevity, you don't even need to buy it now. I just gave you all the good parts. <laughs> the question they always say is are what tell me are you telling me something I don't know? And if the answer is no, I'm telling you something you do know is why are you writing this. We've all we've all seen this though. This meeting could have been an email. That's the, that's the opposite of smart brevity. Why did we do this? This could have been an email. Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why a lot of meetings that could have been an email are meetings? Emotion. People want to attend. Like they think Ugh. that they think that they need to transmit the emotion, and by doing that, they're going to talk to you for twenty minutes. That's too much noise and no signal. But you leave, and you're like, "What was that about?" We've all had those meetings. A friend of mine was talking about this meeting yesterday. Her kids' dance group team company whatever where they go with the kids mm-hmm. go to dance they had this meeting with the instructors and they're like there's too much this and, this and then at the end i was like what was the meaning about she's like i don't know it sounds like they're mad i'm like oh okay you got that emotion yeah. oh my god but smart brevity so i i like this which is get to the point and you don't need to be sterile or insincere about it but you need to clearly communicate it especially in situations like death or something serious do you want so <clears throat> Hearing both of you, I was going to tell a different failure that was not nearly as impactful or funny, but I'll tell a one that's recent. So as m- some of you guys know, but some people may not, my dad had a stroke uh, seven months ago. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I have a $150,000 degree. I'm prepared for this. No physical issues. Everything's pre- everything's a phase. So my degree, awesome. Doesn't work. I mean, you know, I'm sure it helps, but like I have to, I'm like, I have no speech training, right? Speech language pathologists are my friends and several are friends and have helped me. So thank you. I am, my dad's home for a couple months at my house and it's, it was nicer out and I'm, my dad's fine. He's moving around the house just fine. And the air conditioning breaks. My dad does not deal well in heat. So I'm like, I'm working on the air conditioner. I'm working on it. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm trying to solve the problem here. And I say, I think I'm smart. Go jump in the car. The air conditioner in the car will work in 92 seconds you'll be cold and he goes okay so he's in the car my back is to the driveway i'm in the house on the porch working on the air conditioner i have pretend i have no idea what i'm doing and my buddy is facing me now looking to the driveway and he goes um your dad's driving the car and i was like so my dad's just i need to paint the picture should not be driving a car at that point should not be driving a car and I, my mistake was I then let emotion take over and I freaked out because I ran downstairs like a pissed parent and opened the door and what are you doing? And I reached in and grabbed the keys and I was like, you can't be driving a car because I was like, if you had just jammed on the gas, I don't know if you're going to jam on the gas. You would have driven into the pool or something. You would have hurt yourself or others. And I let emotion take over and then my dad spiraled for the rest of the day and oh, it did not help. Yeah. So I let my emotion um take over because i was scared right so fear comes to the top of this where i could have said well he was in park when i did it right so crisis averted right so how do you need to react in that moment uh how i reacted wasn't it so that was a fun mistake and we laughed about it now because he was i was because i looked at him at my buddy and i was like he's not driving the car do you know why he drove the car it was a smart idea he was in the driveway the air conditioner was running so he was cool but the car was in a part of the driveway that was sunny and he was like, well, there's shade right there. I'll just move it in the shade. So it was logical. Yeah. And he did drive the car well. Better if he parked it better than a lot of people I know uh, <laughs> who park in my driveway. And you know who you are. Um, but it was, why is the email or the meeting that could have been an email an email? Emotion. Why do we dance around death notification? Our emotion. Agreed. So that's where bluff or smart brevity, it takes it out. It's like, okay, what is your job here? convey the message be clarity and that's this is also mm-hmm. part of my talk at csm and i didn't think i was going to have a pitch for it but under start with the end in mind if your goal in re- scientific research is to achieve understanding maybe you don't need four thousand words maybe you need 15 mm-hmm. good words mm-hmm. and also my, my 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 session at csm is 
published is the 15 yard line. It's not the end zone. You're still a couple yards away. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to, I tell you about this I tell Rebecca about this. I don't know yeah. I I'm doing a fake, I'm doing like a skit, like a fake football. No, this is new. This since we last chatted. <laughs> Sheila Schindler Ivins is my co-presenter and yeah. she, do, she is the opposite of me. Like if we are the odd couple, she's, I'm Oscar. She's the other guy, the guy who's like put together. I'm the crazy guy. And she's a researcher. And I said, Sheila, I think I want to convey this gap because we love that phrase in science. We will bridge the gap. But I want to do a gap in football terms. And she goes, I don't know football terms. I go, you don't need to know football terms. I'm going to do football. You're going to do science. Receiving the kick, getting grant funding, running plays, doing science, like running play, science, mm-hmm. and analysis. And oh, the, in the booth, the offensive corner dinners, and they're reviewing the iPads and all that stuff. But then I said, I need to, I want a, I want a story to show that getting published is an accomplishment. It is a checkpoint. It is a first down along the way to mm-hmm. your ultimate goal, which when we started this, we decided was understanding, not having been published. I don't go to the gym to have gone to the gym. I'd go to the gym to achieve an outcome. Publishing is not an, publishing's, maybe I'm saying this wrong. Publishing is an outcome, but it's not the ultimate outcome. It's not the final outcome. You started by receiving the kick to score a touchdown. Mm-hmm. So in the story, the Bunsen burners are playing the pseudoscience quacks in the logic bowl, and it's two minutes. And the and the so- team science team team Bunsen burners, they're they're marching down. And if they score, they win. But oh, inexplicably, they take a knee, and the fifteen, they're and they're selling. They're like, we did it. I'm like, but and the whole stadium is like, well, you're why didn't you take a shot at the end zone? You had it. I also want to show the researchers that they're not necessarily all at fault, but you still are responsible. Because mm-hmm. that's how they're rewarded. They're rewarded for getting to the 15 over and over again. Right. And then we're confused why they're 17 years from publish uh, yeah. to bench to bedside or whatever. I'm like, well, I, why don't you just hand it to Marshawn Lynch? He'll punch it in. But we stop because they don't have the tools, the training, and the time or mm-hmm. the incentivization. You don't get any more. And it's not about money for researchers. I'm, I'm not saying this, but it's about like your time is – being tracked right like your boss isn't going to be like paying you for something you're not being rewarded for systems broken so i'm going to give so okay great thanks jimmy doom and gloomy but i'm going to show people 15 different ways to actually do this and you can diy do it yourself you can have someone do it with you or you can have someone do it Mm -hmm. diy do it with you dw do it with y and then dfy do it for you all these things uh you know more resources are required if someone does it for you you got to hire someone but it does, it's not a million dollars. But I'm going to use real real research. I'm going to do the thing. Like, hey, I would say, hey, if you're a researcher, have you written a Twitter thread about your research in language people can understand about the benefits of what you found? And they're like, no. So I'm not just going to say write a Twitter thread. I'm going to write a tw- – we're going to pick a real paper, and I'm going to write a tweet thread. And show oh, that's exciting. Tweet three like that, why I put the link for the full paper at the bottom, not the top. Or the bottom and the top. I don't know. I'm using a theme of the matrix. We picked a paper about walking efficiency and stuff like that. And I'm using it's it's going to be done in the tone of Morpheus. Okay, matrix. but like, how many people are going to know who Morpheus is? It's matter. Good call. So maybe I'll do a different version too. I like. Morpheus. I well, just I mean, I, some of us here are aged and others are not. Hold on a second. Do you know who Morpheus is? Yes. Rebecca. Well, yeah, you and I are the same age. You're the audience. This is researcher to researcher. Okay. And researchers, we all, the the Matrix was a dorky movie. I mean, it was a cool movie. I actually wrote a paper on it in college. (laughs) Thank you for proving me right. Oh, Adam's here. We just had Adam on the show. We do this. Adam! Big reaction reinforces the behavior that we're trying to avoid. The big reaction. This is like us yelling at dogs. Dogs are barking, so we yell at them. Do you know what dogs do? They hear us barking, and they bark back. Right. Humans are the same way, and humans are humans are the same way. We do this as parents too. The big reaction reinforces the behavior. Just had Adam on the show. Ooh. Adam was Adam had some really good insights too, because he's like, I'm a big dude, so when I communicate to patients and I'm standing in the doorway looming, he's like, I don't do that. I like sit down. I yeah. Make I do a lot of kneeling. Actually, I do a lot of kneeling at the bedside, which uh, anybody who works in the emergency department is like gross, but like mm. it, it does matter, particularly when you're trying not to scare people. You know who taught mm-hmm. me that without teaching me that? And my mom years ago was talking about my nursery school teacher. And I'm like, I don't really remember. Then she started saying stuff. And I was like, I do remember this lady. And she's like, what do you remember her about her? And I was like, she was like all over the place. And she's like, I'm like, but I don't know what that means. And she goes, 
your nursery school teacher um, had CP. And I was like, what? She goes, she wore, she wore those crutches. She had, she would use loft strand crutches. Mm -hmm. So this woman would come into her nursery school and it was always a big, this is back in the day, but it was before everybody did this. There was no shoes allowed in the nursery school. And it was because she crawled around the floor. She was on our level all day. And I remember she was like in your face, like in a good way, mm -hmm. instead of being this woman who was three times my size, she right. was like on her arm. She was on her elbows, like doing this. That's I don't know who, How don't cool know who is this that? is. Someone's watching and she says Facebook researchers are so excited to use the big fancy language that the message gets lost. Yes. Give it to I'm going to, I'm yeah. going to challenge it back. Fourth grade. Fourth grade. Yeah. Fourth grade, because that is more matching of what like a typical reading level is of adults in the United States. Really? Ew. Yes. And like, we have to, I think we have to consider like, it's not, not always an education thing. Like sometimes it's a paying attention. Okay, that's case yeah. Enough. Sometimes it's a paying attention and we need to realize like, mm -hmm. we cannot communicate these science concepts at like what we think is an eighth grade level and expect it to be Correct. understood, received. Yeah. I tell people also, all we the have time. so much context. We have so much context for science. Agreed. And other people don't. And I think that was a huge issue during the height of the pandemic, right? Was like, do your own research. Uh, but like people really, they're not, they're not trained to do that. They're not prepared to yes. do that. They're not prepared mm -hmm. to understand research, let alone integrate mm -hmm. it and apply it to their specific situation. But also nobody wants to be told what to do. They do want to do their own research, but we need to make it accessible for people. Why do you research. think researchers are so excited to use big fancy language? I'll put this out to you and to people watching. Casey, thank you for this comment. I'll, it's the same thing Adam just said. It's an emotion. I want people, I feel, in, I, I want to make sure I feel like I'm on the level. I want people to mm -hmm. think I'm on the level. This is an imposter syndrome or making sure people know that I'm smart. Yep. So yeah. I'm going to use the biggest words possible. Yep. This is how my podcast started. I saw someone on stage doing a thing. And I'm like, I want to know that. But they were like all buttoned up and using big pontification words. And then I ran into them at a bar 20 minutes later. And I understood their 90 minute presentation in 11 and a half minutes. And I was like, boom, where were you? Where was that dude? And he was like, well, yeah. I was presenting. And I was like, they invited you to present because you're smart and you knew stuff. But how you shared it was the failure. But Society tells us how to act. Like right now, I'm wearing pants. You can't see it, but society says you're supposed to wear pants, right? So society tells us what's okay. So we watch presenters present, and then we're like, well, that's obviously how I'm supposed to do it. So I'm going to do it like that. Yes. And yeah. then I meet all these people behind the scenes at bars at CSM, and I'm like, dude, you'd be a great presenter. And they're like, yeah. And they get up there, and I'm like, who the hell was that? Mm -hmm. But I can't stop yeah. there. I want to show people, because, and I said this earlier today, healthcare. I know you feel like you're in tell business. Researchers are so excited to use the big fan fancy language and the message is lost. I know you think you're in tell business. You're in show business. We just told three stories of failure, right? We told them, but with a story, you get to show them. You get to show it. And that's, I think, a key message. Oh, well, I'm going to bring this back to my next failure. Back. I'm going to bring it back. You have another failure? This is, this is kind of the thing. So in my first job, I wanted that job so badly and I wanted to be the best at it and I wanted to be indispensable and I wanted everybody to be shocked at how good I was at it, that I completely did things the way I thought I was supposed to without mm -hmm. understanding why I was supposed to yeah. and got tunnel vision. Well, that's how the so-and-so does it. So I'm only going to do it that way. And so I was looking at how I was supposed to do things instead of at the patient for how I needed to be doing things. And then if somebody tried to give me feedback, I was like, no, I've got this. I think I know what I'm doing. And so I totally closed myself off to feedback. And what that ended up in was one of the worst things anybody has ever said to me since I've been a physical therapist. And, and I'm glad that I, I still can look back on it and I can see what I own in that and I can see what they own in that. But the comment that I got in my first job was, maybe somewhere, someday, you'll be a good physical therapist. And I still like have imposter syndrome from that. I still carry that with me, but I can see from the way I was behaving that I had fail. I was failing my patients. I was failing mm -hmm. myself. And I had such a fixed mindset that I couldn't let in any of that feedback. I couldn't, I couldn't learn. I like literally could not learn because I was- when you're trying to copy, you can't fail. Right. 
And I was like, so afraid of being found out for being a fraud when in fact I was, because I was like, not serving my patients in the way they needed to be served. This is the Easter ham story. You guys know the Easter ham story? Well, no, but yeah. I cannot wait. All right. So a mother and daughter, right? Mother and 10 year old daughter. Every year, the mother has Easter and the daughter sits there at the kitchen island and watches mom prepare the ham and she does the basting and she puts pineapple things. I don't know all the things, she cuts the ham in half and does the basting and prepares it and does all the thing, puts it in the oven, does it the same way every single year until the girl eventually becomes a woman and she gets married and she has a house. And now she is going to host Easter dinner and she can't wait to show mom. I did this. I'm, you know, I'm going to do it like you. Mom comes. Now it's the reversal. Mom is sitting at the island watching the daughter prepare everything. And she does this and this and this and this and this. And she does it. She puts the pineapples and she cuts the ham and she bases it, puts it in, takes it out. Now's the moment. Mom's going to gonna sample the ham. And she takes a bite and she goes, it's fantastic. This is amazing. You know, she's like, I paid attention to you all those years. She goes, mom goes, but I have a question. Okay. You took the pineapples on there. You put them in there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you basted it. And you, did it and you cut the ham in half. And she goes, mm -hmm. why do you cut the ham in half? She said, you, you did that every year. Yeah, we lived in an apartment in Brooklyn. Our oven was this big. I could not <laughs> fit the, the ham in the oven if it was whole. I cut it in half because it did not fit. You live in the burbs. You got a huge oven. Why you cut the ham in half? She cut it in half because she never questioned why she cut the ham in half. She tried yeah. to it. Well, it's just a story of like healthy questioning. I think questioning sometimes is seen as a bad thing. I hope it's not. People look at me. I go into you know communication evaluation meetings or branding meetings, and people are like they think it. They're just going to tell me what happens and come out. And I go. I'm here to ask a ton of questions. They are not threatening. I need help me understand. It's a great mm -hmm. prefix. I think I talked about yeah. that, with Adam. Help me understand is a great prefix to anything. But I think we don't do enough healthy questioning. I also think it's because we do it on social platforms, and mm -hmm. there's we know depth there, and it can come across a certain way. And that's where I think that book, uh, Never Split the Difference, helps. Because all that guy was, he was a hostage negotiator. All he had was questions on a phone with someone who was in a high-stakes situation who probably mm -hmm. didn't want But the ham story is an example of that. I did the same thing. So my, my second failure comes from radio. It was the same as the ham story. I came to a radio station as like the number two guy, came to a new state, and I worked under this guy, Chris Lloyd. Great boss. Great boss. And I learned from him and I did exactly what he was doing. And he was a couple of years older than me and he'd been at that station for a while. And I was like training to be his, to do his job either at another radio station or when he moved on two years in, he goes and moves on. And now I have a two month job opportunity while the radio station company is looking for a replacement. They should not have hired a 24 year old me to do this. <laughs> and I had two months to run the station in the interim. So I went and just did everything Chris did for those two months or the, the first couple of weeks. I slept on my couch. I never slept. I had GI issues because I was so focused on every question was, how did Chris do this? What would Chris do? How would Chris, this is a new situation. How would Chris answer? I would call him. You imagine this? I'm like a 24-year-old kid calling a 30-year-old man who does not work for your company anymore. And he took mm -hmm. him. And I'm like, Chris, what do, what do, what, what do, what do you, what, what should I do here? Here's the situation. What do I do? What do I do? And he's like, and he finally was like, dude, they put you in charge of a five plus million dollar radio station while I'm gone. It's not by accident, imposter syndrome. And he's like, you can't for some stuff for a while, you're going to be able to photocopy what I did, but life, everything moves. So yeah. if you were my number two, if you were my music director there and I was still there, what would you tell me to think about? What would you tell me to do? I was like, Oh, I tell you to do this and this. Great. Do that. And I was like, great. So don't keep the ham in half just because Chris used to cut the ham in half. Ask, what are we facing here? And I think that's how you lead. That's That was the biggest lesson. And I started sleeping again. And my GI issues went away. And my stress level went down. And I started liking what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And that's important. That was sort of a parallel to what you were talking about, where you were trying to be everything. You can't. Newsflash. You can't. Don't try. But you will. Yeah. Then you'll fail. And then I was trying to cook everything like the ham, too. It right. didn't matter if it was pasta or not. I was putting the pineapples <laughs> on it. I was putting right. it in the oven. Like, it did. It, like, it just didn't work. And so if you're a student PT and you're hearing this, like you've got to find your own way. You have the tools, mm -hmm. but you need to be the one that uses them. And it's more about the patient than how other people are practicing. Mm -hmm. So that was mm -hmm. my. Well, Elise, what's your second failure? Did you have one? 
Man. So we're going to bring it back actually to the ethics question that we were like, let's get her on the podcast. Cause yes. Um, so mine kind of goes along with the theme of healthy questioning. I really should have done more of this and kind of that pause to stop and just look at what's happening around me. So I took my dream job as my first job out of physical therapy school. It was exactly what I wanted it to be until it wasn't. And I really can't say like I woke up one day, it was a nightmare because it really was a gradual wearing down over time. And my first indication was actually the first day of work. I was being oriented to the space. Long story short, we were inside of a like a, like an office building where we were leasing the space. And so we didn't have a lot of ability to change things. We were borrowing space. And because of that, because of the organizational structure and the like bodies, the powers that be that do the, um, Oh, what's the word? Like quality checks, making sure you're doing what you're doing or doing you're supposed to be doing, Um, instead of having a private room where I could treat patients all by myself, we were sharing that space and that goes against regulations. And my boss at the time said, when this body comes and does their inspection, that's the word I'm looking for. Just tell them we don't have a space. We use this. And so that asking of me to lie on the very first day should have been the leave the the door now. Red flags. Right. Like it was the reddest of red flags. And I was so desperate. Like, A, I thought this was my dream job. And it was until it wasn't. But also, this was such a powerful lesson for me in boundaries and setting boundaries. And I remember even my CI told me this. Like as if she, I think she knew me because she knew that I was going to experience this at some point. She was like, if you give them a step, they will take three. And she was so, so right. And the rest of the time that I was there, two years, every week was a step in pushing what I was comfortable with and what I was willing to put up with because they knew ultimately like I was there to help patients and like that is absolutely what I was put on this earth to do. And I have such like, I wear my heart on my sleeve in that capacity. And some people know that and they will try to take advantage of that. And so it sucked. It was two years of hell. It was another year of hell after I left because I was like, I was coping and trying to bounce back from that. But now it's an opportunity that I literally have had three different therapists who took the job after me after they took the job, they found me and asked me about things. And I can share that experience with them. And I can share now all three of them have left. Yep, not an accident. And I think that's part of my journey is I can now share that experience with other therapists. And ideally, like, this is what I've learned how not to do and how not to practice. I hope you will take that and have a better launching pad in your own career by not making those same mistakes I did. That's why when Rebecca brought this topic up today, I was like, yeah, because failure teaches us more than success does. What were we going to say, Rebecca? Well, Jimmy, you asked a question, I think on Facebook, maybe last week, and it was like, what advice would you give a new grad? And my comment that I think applies to both of us, at least, is the first job may not be that job. And it probably isn't. And even if it's the dream job, it still might not be the job. And it's okay for that. Because I thought I had my dream job. You thought you had your dream job. Both of us learned in different ways that that was not the case. And then Mm -hmm. I went on to be hopefully a good physical therapist somewhere else after that comment. But I think that's a mistake that we get into too, is we've convinced ourselves that something is perfect and we can, we can turn a blind eye to so much. To, to prove yes. to ourselves we made the right choice. Yes. And so we can't anymore. And then and this then happens what? In, this happens in abusive relationships, mm-hmm. right? Call it mm-hmm. enabling, right? You you become enabling where you're like, well, this is the lobster in a pot, right? You put a two ways you you boil a lobster is number one, you get a big old pot, you start boiling the water and you mm-hmm. throw the lobster in. Trust me, the lobster knows. I've talked to lobsters, they know. The other way is you put a lobster in a pot, lukewarm water. Lobsters are like, that's cool. I like water. And then you slowly and you start heating it up. It doesn't notice. That's what people who are asking you to break the rules do. They wouldn't, they wouldn't come and be like, at least today we're going to commit murder. You'd be like, no, too much. (laughs) What they did was they were like, we're just going to do this and that's it. And you're like that. uh, I don't, 
Okay. All right. Well, I think mean, I guess you seem. Cool. I really like the frog example. So it's similar to the lobster. So if you put a frog, if you take a frog and drop them in boiling water, they will jump out. Right. But the right. frog will not jump out if you slowly incrementally turn up that water right. until it's boiling. And I do think that as especially as a new grad. And now that I've been practicing for five years, I have a lot of lessons learned and a lot more to learn still. But I do think that is that imagery for me. I was the frog in the slowly increasing yeah. temperature. Yeah. And it was not until I was at boiling that I finally saw, oh, I need to jump out. That's okay. But yeah. I sat in it for years. That's okay for them, the people asking you to do that, because they'll just find another frog. Exactly. Just and they did. Okay. They found three more frogs. I think frogs better because lobsters don't jump very well. So I think from <laughs> now on, I'm going to tell that story because like lobsters are just like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Just what I got to know, though, really, is are there going to be like recipes in the show notes? Because now you've told us, taught us how to cook a ham and how to cook a lobster <laughs> and a frog. So I think we need to have like Pinterest links to the recipes for this. Weirdest food you've ever eaten. Oh, I had alligator. I had ostrich. <clears throat> These were never, I never ordered them. That's it was always someone ordered it and they were like, do you want to try this? I'm like, I that's guess. That's Cajun food. Cajun. Um, I had a cheese fried worm at science camp one summer. Nope. Nope. Um, like a nope. This is kind of boring, but every time I say this to somebody, they are like super grossed out. So when I was a kid, I was really allergic to milk. And so I used to eat orange juice on my cereal. That's so good. I need you to imagine like. No. It. Yeah. And then like, do you brush your teeth before? Or do you brush your teeth after? It's like, so Both. It's, it's gross either way. Um, <laughs> yeah. Orange juice and cereal. But I have to tell you every once in a while, like as a comfort thing, I still, I still do it. <laughs> and now you makes me happy. That's the weirdest thing I've heard in a long time. Right? Well, okay. Long it's not a cheese fried worm. I can't keep up with that. Both cheese and worms are food and orange juice soaking in cornflakes or lucky charms. That's a lot of ass. Grape nuts. <coughs> what? Grape nuts? Oh grape nuts. Oh Crispex. So you were like, let me pour some orange juice on some gravel. That's what grape nuts are. Uh-huh. And then, and then chew for 35 minutes. Yeah. Great uh-huh. when you get those masseter muscles. All right. Uh, let's wrap this thing up with the parting shot. What would you, How would you sum up any part of this with the audience? At least what, what would your parting shot be for today? Ooh. Well, first of all, I think you need to read the ethics section in the APTA magazine because that. This month? Is it a good one? I haven't read it yet, but I mean, just in general, I read it every month. And I, I feel like the ethical situations that we talked about in PT school were so black and white. Yes. In the real world in practice, it is gray. And I think you need to be abundantly clear. And this comes with practice. It comes with time. But be abundantly clear on where your lines are. And when those lines are crossed, walk away. Yeah. Period. Everything out in the real world is peri aqueductal gray. That is the official color of, of ethical issues we discussed on a previous Ooh, episode. I, like I can't it. remember what it but that's the official color. Parting shot, Rebecca Griffith. I think like failure is free, but like learning from it and growing from it is costly yeah. or it can be, but that it's worth that cost to be okay. better and to learn from that. Because I think if both Elise and I had stayed being the way we were in the places we were, we wouldn't be who we are now. And I would pr- probably still be like hiding in the bathroom at work. So you gotta, you gotta put in the cost. I had a Twitter interaction with some guy. I can't remember who, but you know, Nick hoops, Nick hopes. <laughs> mm-hmm. He said something about failure and I, and then someone was like, I don't know why you love failure. I'm over here loving success. And I was like, I'm going to agree with Nick on this one. He's like, well, have over, I'm over here on success Island. And I want to be like, you either lucked out and then good for you that you mm-hmm. got to success Island without failure. But I'm like, my canoe and or is made out of failure. And that's more reliable. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to chuck it. I'm going to give it a shot. Right. I mean, I think that's what, that's one element that like art and music and sports gives you is you are chock full of failure. Mm-hmm. Like, dude, like you will score a goal, but do you know how many times you're going to fail at the thing that scored you the goal? And the only way to do that, do you think you learn anything from doing the triple deke the first time and scoring? You don't. No. And then you double down. So I would say, yeah, I would say bluff. I like acronyms. Bluff, bottom line up front. Yeah. Fail, first attempt in learning. I would say the only way I was a good radio DJ was I was a crappy radio DJ, but wanted it bad enough to go through what Seth Godin, yeah. great writer, calls the suck. He's like, the suck will come, and you have to like it. 
And that's why I don't make sweaters or cook hams as my thing. I, Cause I don't like it to start and I'm not going to go through the suck. Uh, ladies, we'll be back next week and that's one week prior to CSM. What do we want to talk about yeah. next week? Any ideas or we'll come up with them or happy to take some thoughts uh, <clears throat> to any of our social channels from the audience of what we like to discuss. Mm -hmm. We have done some previous live streams and episodes on what we're going to, what we're presenting on, what we're looking forward to. So I'll just throw it out there. If the audience wants to ha hear us discuss something, always open to it. You can throw it yeah. in the old smorgasbord. Um, that's all I got. I like it. They say the, uh, the best conversations happen at happy hour. Thanks for coming on. Yeah.